introduce her. So, hey, seen Pam? Oh, she's in the back there. Okay. Since I introduced her right at the beginning, I'd like her to be in her chair. Okay. Okay, everyone, we're ready to begin. Let me welcome everyone to this public session of the Knight Commission on Intercollegiate Athletics. I'm Carol Cartwright, the Knight Commission's co-chair, and I'll be sharing meeting facilitation duties with my colleague and co-chair, Arnie Duncan. Uh, before we introduce the first session, I want to publicly welcome four new members of the Knight Commission. Uh, Eric Barron, president of Penn State University, Pam Bernard, Vice President and General Counsel, Duke University, Michael Crow, Arizona State University President, and Jacques McClendon, Director of Player Engagement for the Los Angeles Rams. We also want to thank Alberto Embarguin, President and CEO of the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation for the Knight Foundation's support of this public meeting and for the Foundation's long-term commitment to the Commission's work. A few reminders as we begin this session. Video and audio from today's sessions are being recorded and will be posted to the Knight Commission website, knightcommission.org. Commission members and panelists, please use the microphones when speaking. We are pleased to have media and others here to listen to our panel sessions and following the conclusion of the second session at around 11.35 this morning, there will be an opportunity for media to interact with the panelists from this session and the second session. Uh, we're gonna go straight from this session into the second session, so defer those media contacts until after the second session. And then following the third session, those panelists will be available. And also, Arnie Duncan and I will be available to talk to the media after the conclusion of the third panel. Information on all of our panelists and summaries of the sessions are in your packets. So given the limited time we have, we'll not provide the backgrounds of each panelist. But as their biographies clearly show, we're very fortunate to have the top experts in the country on these subjects with us today for our meeting. So thank you all. As background for this session, in September 2017, a federal investigation into fraud in college basketball made it clear that reform was needed. The NCAA Board of Governors appointed an independent commission on college basketball, shared by Dr. Condoleezza Rice, to examine the issues and provide recommendations. In April of 2018, the Commission on College Basketball, also known as the Rice Commission, issued a set of recommendations, which were then studied by working groups within the NCAA membership. A number of reforms were adopted in October 2018, and many changes are taking effect this year. The guests joining us today are here to provide an update on the actions taken to date and to discuss the ongoing challenges that remain. First, we'll hear from NCAA staff members Kevin Lennon, Don Gavitt, and Carrie Vancinas, followed by Mike Bray, head men's basketball coach at the University of Notre Dame and president of the board of directors of the National Association of Basketball Coaches. Panelists, we ask that you provide your over overview remarks in an eight to 10 minute time frame. We have an orange card here that we're going to hold up if the time limit is approaching and it's time to wrap up. So I'll begin with Kevin Lennon. Great, thank you President Cartwright, um, Chairman Duncan, and, and thank you members for the opportunity here to share with you the significant progress that has been made um, to help the sport of college basketball, the culture around college basketball, to address issues of integrity and fairness within the collegiate model, to enhance our student athlete well-being, and then to improve the NSA governance of intercollegiate athletics. Carol did a great job of outlining kind of why we're here and how we got here. Uh, it's less than two years ago when the uh, federal investigation into fraud in men's basketball was first announced to the world and very proud of the activities within the NCAA to move forward quickly to address these challenges. 
President Emmert, the Board of Governors, is led by Bud Peterson, and the Board of Directors acted quickly on, on appointing the Rice Commission. Those recommendations have been accepted fully by the NSA governance structure, and the NSA now owns those issues. And I think that's important for you all to know, and I think you're going to hear today exactly what that means in terms of positive changes moving forward. Um, it was an ambitious timeline and to accomplish this, so I would note a couple of things. I think it's important to be aware that what you're going to hear here represents a package of reform efforts. We all may quibble about certain aspects of the reform, whether they've gone far enough at this point in time, or perhaps additional measures need to be taken. But I think much like the academic reform package that you champion and that Walter Harrison led on behalf of the NCA, it is the, the powers behind the package of changes that are being introduced here. And I think that's important to keep in mind as you hear from my colleagues. Uh, I'm going to focus my remarks on a couple of areas and then we'll turn it over to my in national office colleagues and then Mike will include his remarks. I'll focus on the increased accountability and the consequences within the NCA governance to, to make sure that we have fair competition and enhanced integrity and talk a little bit about the degree completion requirements that are a part of this package. So let me begin with the accountability and consequences aspect. Um, from a positional perspective, the Commission challenged the NCA to examine accountability at the highest levels within the NCAA and our campus structures at the presidential level, the athletic director level, and those of head coaches. And while there certainly have been a number of measures that have already been in place to, to enhance accountability, some additional changes were made recently that I think you need to be aware of. First of all, is an, a yearly attestation requirement that will be required for all athletics department staff members, full-time and part-time, as well as the presidents of the universities. One important aspect of this attestation that I think you need to be aware of is that this gave us an opportunity to distinguish the responsibility of presidents. And again, going back to your very first report when you talked about presidential accountability in the commission, um, to distinguish what is a president responsible for in terms of their athletics program and an acknowledgement that they understand their obligations under the principles of institutional control and rules compliance. And that has been reaffirmed. But I think as importantly, for the directors of athletics. And what we have seen is now a clear distinction of the role between what a president plays, who has many other responsibilities, as you know, versus a director of athletics. And so this attestation will assign increased accountability to the directors of athletics to what they attest to every year on behalf of the staff members that they employ. And so we took this as an opportunity to provide greater clarity and assignment of responsibilities distinguishing the president from the directors of athletics. There also was an increased cooperation requirement that was adopted in the legislation that now contracts that are written for presidents, for athletic directors and coaches, must contain a clause that indicates that the individual will cooperate fully in an NCA investigative process. And that language has now been, and needs to be added as all contracts move forward for the affected individuals. I would also share with you that um, a, a new uh, change was made in terms of, of implications should an institution, should a president and an athletics director hire an individual who is already under a show cause, has already demonstrated uh, a lack of commitment to rules compliance and is under show cause, should an institution hire that individual, there will be increased scrutiny and increased vulnerability in the event that that individual commits another violation. And I know that that has been a source of conversation. So, those aspects are a part of the, the, uh, um, the broader uh, new changes that have been made in terms of positional accountability. Our athletic directors have been asked by the presidents, um, and particularly through the council, and Tom McMillan working with his lead one, and Bob Vecchioni with NACTA, to also examine further whether additional steps should be taken for directors of athletics given the key role that they play. Should we and would the collegiate model benefit by increased accountability, increased clarification of expectations that presidents have and that they have of themselves as they conduct an athletics program. And that examination is underway to see whether more needs to be done in addition to the changes that I mentioned to you. Our head coaches, as you know, already have a head coach responsibility requirement that's in the bylaw itself. And I would note that 58 times a coach has been cited for a violation of head coach control over the last six years. It's being taken very seriously. And Mike and others can certainly speak to the impact that this legislation has had on them and 
the fact that they are responsible for those who act under them as a part of their programs. Um, and so more work will need to be done there. One of the additional changes there I would note is that for the first time, should an individual fail to cooperate in the investigative process, the Committee on Infractions would have the ability to suspend that individual immediately. And so, again, hand in hand with the contractual requirement of, of cooperating, this is a new tool that allows the Committee on Infractions to say if you're not participating actively in the process, a suspension can occur immediately, and we believe that will have positive effects on the culture. In terms of penalties and consequences, I would note a couple of things. Um, in the, the toolkit, if you will, that's now available to the Committee on Infractions, stronger penalties have been identified for violators, longer postseason bans, loss of all postseason revenue sharing, up to a lifetime ban for coaches, head coach restrictions that can span more than one season, and full year recruiting restrictions are now a part of the array for the Committee on Infractions as they assess uh, individual culpability and institutional failure in this regard. So that, those are important things to note. The penalty structure hopefully will act now as an increased deterrent for poor behavior. Our enforcement staff has now been armed with some new tools that we think are gonna help as well. The idea of importation, that the enforcement and the infractions process can import information obtained from uh, other sources outside the NCA structure as it adjudicates those matters is an important new development. We have a negotiated resolution uh, process now that says when an institution the Committee on Infractions and the, and, the, and the enforcement staff agree on all the penalties and the facts themselves should an institution want an expedited process to say, yes, we, we did these things and we want to move through the structure more quickly. We now have in our array a negotiated resolution settlement that we think will be helpful for parties that uh, do not have to uh, have an elongated um, Committee on Infractions process, if you will. And I've already mentioned the failure to cooperate resulting in immediate suspensions. One of the big new components here then is the creation of this independent investigators and decision makers, kind of the off-ramping of cases that are deemed to be complex. And this was uh, one of the most critical points in the report, and this is very new uh, in the NSA structure and will be effective this August, which would allow then uh, cases that are deemed to be complex, whether they uh, challenge core values within the association whether there's adversarial posturing that exists within the institution and not really a shared governance or shared ownership of the issues, whether there's breaches of confidence, whatever it may be, the school or the Committee on Infractions or the Vice President of Enforcement can recommend that a case now be off-ramp to an independent body that would involve independent investigators as necessary and independent adjudicators outside the NSA structure to take on that particular case. When it's deemed to be a more effective way than using the current process within the NCA to resolving these matters. And again, all of that will be effective August 1 and the NCA is prepared to begin implementation of, of the off uh, ramp process. Um, I would note in that regard um, that there's a, a real commitment to making sure that that is successful. And we've identified a number of, of individuals who will help oversee that process. Carrie will talk in a moment about some of the independent um, decision makers um, that have now entered our governance structure who will be helpful in providing oversight over this new uh, element of our uh, enforcement process. The final thing that I'd like to talk about here, and I've done this, by the way, with no orange card coming in front of me, um, so I would note that for my colleagues, um, I want to shift gears just a little bit here and talk about then the degree completion component, which obviously this has been something that's been incredibly important to the Knight Commission through its history, reminding the NCA of our fundamental purpose of educating young people who want to participate in, in, in intercollegiate athletics and making sure that we're doing all we can to get that done. So one of the aspects here is that when a, a young person has participated at least two years in men's or women's basketball, and this is a pilot program for them, that all Division I institutions must have a degree completion program in place to invite these young people back who have elected to leave school for whatever reason to have a program that invites them back so that they can complete those degrees. And by August 1, every institution in Division I should have such a program in place. The NSA has provided funding to a large number of limited resource institutions that will assist them in making sure that the program is available and is active and is working on their campus. So 
Uh, Madam Cartwright, I will leave with that, those comments there, and I'll save some time for my colleagues and move to Dan Gavitt. Thank you. Uh, Kevin, before we move to, to Dan, uh, may I ask just one question for clarification? When you talked about the off-ramp, it, it's my understanding that even though that will be a set of independent adjudicators, it's, they still have to operate within the body of the NCAA rules. Yeah, that, that is correct. So we're still bound by the rules that the membership itself would adopt, and, and so that is exactly right. That would be the lens with which the case would be adjudicated. Okay. That's an important point, I think. Thank you. Dan, over to you. Thank you. Well, good morning. It's an honor to be invited to present to the Knight Commission. Uh, this is a very important time in the history of college basketball. I, I'd say, indeed, youth through early adult basketball in our country. Much has changed in the broad landscape of basketball over the last couple of decades. An evolving college basketball with the times is both a challenge and an imperative. I believe that we are focused to, on bringing change to college basketball, engaged with all of the key organizations in the game. I will focus my uh, remarks on the basketball-specific reforms. Our staff at the NCA has worked very hard and earnestly during the last year to honor the great work of Dr. Condoleezza Rice and the Commission on College Basketball Reform Initiatives. We're a competitive team that is determined to deliver on the vision of the Commission. I think it's important, as Kevin noted, to keep in perspective the ambitious timeline with which the new summer basketball initiatives have been implemented. The NCAA Board of Governors adopted the Commission recommendations in August, just nine months ago. And the changes for June and July 2019 were basically set within the subsequent six months by mid-February. We're now weeks away from the new initiatives happening, and while we don't expect to meet the vision and objectives fully in year one, we're confident that improvements through the experience and adjustment will be made to make even better the results in the next couple of years. Changes to the summer recruiting calendar for the NCAA Division I coaches was recommended by the National Association of Basketball Coaches and endorsed by the Commission on College Basketball. Overarching goals of the changes were twofold. One, to minimize the harmful outside influences and reduce involvement of third parties in the recruiting process. And two, enhance the relationships and collaboration in youth basketball with USA Basketball, the National Basketball Association, the National Basketball Players Association, and high school and two-year governing bodies, notably the National Federation of State High School Associations, the NFHS. Recruiting calendar initiatives start with the new June scholastic events for high school participants. Meant to increase the influence and re-engagement of high school coaches in the college recruitment and student development process, the June scholastic events will be held only at educational institutions the last two weekends of the month. Friday evening through Sunday afternoon, June, June 21 through 23, and 28 through 30. The NFHS, under the excellent leadership of Dr. Carissa Niehoff, who I believe is here with us this morning, and the National High School Basketball Coaches Association, led ably by Dave Archer, have both been willing and supportive partners in creating new opportunities for evaluation of high school prospects, in many cases with their high school teams. In order to provide the opportunity for June scholastic event participation as broadly as possible across the nation, other state high school associations and two-year colleges have also an avenue for event approval through the NCA. Over 30 events, including high schools from over 40 states, will be participating in the first year, run exclusively by either state high school associations or state high school coaches associations. NCA Division I coaches may only attend approved scholastic events during those two June weekends and no other events. In July, where there were previously three long weekends of NCAA certified non-scholastic event opportunities for NCA Division I coaches to attend, this summer there will only be one NCA certified non-scholastic event period, the traditional first weekend this year, July 11th through the 14th. The non-scholastic events in July, as well as those held in April, will be subject to more rigorous NCAA certification requirements to ensure transparency in finances and operations in an effort to reform any issues of corruption around non-scholastic basketball. 
In place of the last two certified non-scholastic event weekends this summer will be the new NCAA College Basketball Academy, July 22nd through the 28th. The purpose of the NCAA College Basketball Academy is to provide high school Division I prospects with the opportunity to develop their basketball skills and be evaluated by Division I coaches, as well as, equally importantly, to experience academic, health, wellness, and life skills programming to benefit their future and engage with prospects and their families earlier in the college recruitment process to share information transparently. The NCAA membership is paying all expenses for upwards of 2,400 rising seniors, juniors, and select number of sophomores, as well as one parent or guardian, to attend and participate in the College Basketball Academy. There will be four different regional sites held on college campuses, this year at the University of Connecticut, Grand Canyon University, the University of Houston, and the University of Illinois. Coaches and commissioners of the College Basketball Academy will include current NCAA Division II and III coaches, high school coaches, former professional players aspiring to be coaches, and former Division I head coaches. The NABC has been a valuable partner in developing the plans for the NCAA College Basketball Academy, and we will be utilizing guidelines developed by USA Basketball and the NBA for appropriate hours of daily competition and activity. Division I coaches may only attend NCAA College Basketball Academy or the USA Basketball Junior National Team mini camp held in Colorado Springs at the same time. The USA Basketball Junior National Team is an example of one of the most important basketball related recommendations from the Commission on College Basketball, which is to enhance the relationship and collaborate with USA Basketball, the NBA, the NBPA, the NAFHS, and the NABC in youth basketball developments. Our NCA team has had a regular and productive collaboration with Jim Tooley at USA Basketball, Kathy Behrens and Kiki Vandeweghe at the NBA, Michelle Roberts at the NBPA, Carissa Niehoff at the NFHS, and Jim Haney at the NABC, and all of their respective teams including two key NCA, uh, excuse me, NBA staff members that you will hear from later, David Kraszewski and Garth Glissman. The expanded USAB Junior National Team Program, which is now a year-round opportunity for the top 20 to 25 players per class, is directly supported in partnership with the NCA and the NBA. In collaboration with the NBPA, NCA Division I coaches will now also have the opportunity to support the NBPA Top 100 camp in June by attending to evaluate prospects. The NCA is deploying staff to these programs and events to educate prospects on the scholarship opportunities available in college basketball and the academic requirements for participation. We're also working very closely with the NBPA on the new agent certification process, which will be launched in August as recommended by the commission. Finally, an update for you on the proposed and adopted changes to the process for college student athletes pursuing their professional basketball opportunities, which is timely as we're in the middle of the NBA pre-draft process calendar with the combine last week in Chicago and the NCAA deadline for withdrawal from the draft next week on May 29th. This is the first year the college players testing the waters have had the opportunity to engage the services of a certified agent defined this year as an NBPA certified agent. After requesting evaluation from the NBA Undergraduate Advisory Committee, college student athletes may sign an agreement with a certified agent for counsel during the pre-draft process, provide that the agreement is disclosed to the student, student athlete's school and is terminated if the student returns to school. The agent may provide enrolled student athletes and their families with meals, lodging and transportation when meeting with an agent or a professional team. The recommendation to allow for college student athletes to test the waters and go all the way through the draft and return to school if undrafted is not yet implemented. That opportunity is delayed until undrafted player status as an automatic NBA free agent is adjusted by the NBA and the MBPA if collectively bargained in order to avoid college players being called up to the NBA or the G League during the season. 
Thanks for the opportunity to present to you this morning. I do look to uh, answer any questions that you have at the end of the session. And that's my pleasure to introduce Carrie Vincennes. Thank you, Danny, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me here today. So um, the two topics I'm going to report on, one is the last piece of the college basketball reform that Kevin mentioned about independent voices on the Board of Governors, and the second one is a newer initiative on coaches' credentialing. So to start, um, in April of 2018, the Commission on College Basketball recommended five independent members be added to the Board of Governors to add outside voices and perspectives to uh, the highest governing board of the association. This was a change that, was, that required a two-thirds vote of the membership to add the board members, and that vote was taken and passed in January of this year. Immediately following that vote, the call went out the following day to solicit nominations for independent members. And independent, it's important to note, is defined as someone who is not a salaried employee of any NCA member school, conference, or affiliated organization. We uh, engaged a third party, uh, Hydric and Struggles, who vetted over 250 nominations that came to the nominating committee, which was the executive committee of the Board of Governors. The nominating committee considered individuals from a wide variety of services, uh, backgrounds, experiences, including healthcare, financial services, technology, the public sector, with an emphasis on seeking diversity of industry and functional experiences. Including, in addition to that, uh, previously sports playing experience and ultimate commi commitment to the overall mission of student athlete success. After the nominating committee did some further vetting, they put forward a slate of candidates, and the Board of Governors approved that slate on April 30th of this year. As you may have seen, the Board of Governors appointed Ken Chenault, the Chairman and Managing Director of General Catalyst and former Chairman of the Chief Executive Officer of American Express. Also appointed was Mary Sue Coleman, who was the president of the Association of American Universities and the former president of Universities of Michigan and Iowa. Also, Grant Hill was appointed former college and MBA athlete and current broadcaster and MBA team owner. Dennis McDonough, the senior principal and chair of the Rework America Task Force for the Markle Foundation and former chief of staff to President Barack Obama. And Vivek Murthy, the 19th Surgeon General of the United States. So these five members will also have other appointments to um, subcommittees, including the Executive Committee, the uh, Board of Governors Finance and Audit Committee, and the Independent Accountability Oversight Committee that Kevin was describing. Currently, the Board of Governors includes 16 college and university presidents and chancellors representing each division as voting members, chairs of the Division I Council and the Division II and three management council as ex officio non-voting members, as well as the NCA president, and now there's five new independent voices on that board. As promised to the membership, as part of this, we've developed a robust orientation program, and we're kicking that off with our first members this week. So with that, I will go ahead and transition then to um, the new coaches credentialing initiative. I know that was a topic that you all took up back in um, the fall. And um, I have had, first of all, before I start, I want to thank you for your engagement on this topic. I've had a number of conversations with folks in this room around the credentialing concept and, and the opportunity to engage and, and really focus on education. Some of you may know my background before I came to the NCA. I was a professor of education, um, and really my passion and what brought me to the NCA was education. So President Emmert thought it was a good fit for me to uh, lead this up. So when we started talking with you all around coaches credentialing, we started talking about the importances, the importance rather, of how coaches are uniquely positioned to influence a young person's life. And many other professions like education, legal, and others adhere to this model, but yet there's no comprehensive coaching credentialing system for college coaches. Obviously, some NGBs have licensing or certification requirements, but a comprehensive system has not yet been established. As you recall, I mentioned your meeting in the fall, Terry Steve Gronow, the Vice President of Division II, Daniel Donahue of the WBCA were here with others to discuss coaches certification Division II. Division II had been piloting uh, Division II University 
that launched back in the fall. And then back in January at our convention, they changed um, the legislation to replace the recruiting test with an annual, annual certification for coaches that requires annual education. So their work serves as a foundation on which we can build. So after considering our initial conversations in January, the Board of Governors, and as we mentioned, President Peterson is the chair of that group, directed staff to examine the concept of coaches credentialing. Simultaneously, we partnered with the NABC and the WBCA in January and started socializing the idea of credentialing. When we got out of the gate, really we wanted to start to talk to people about what credentialing actually was. I and mean, this is not a topic that was discussed widely, and so we spent the, the winter months talking to different groups, including our management councils, our Division I council, uh, the coaches associations, about what the concept of credentialing actually is. And so the internal group was, um, again, established to, um, some, established to put together some foundational information and socialize, again, those concepts with the membership. So with that, we established four primary goals that go with credentialing. So the first is to develop an association-wide foundation to coaches credentialing, grounded in accessible and meaningful education that provides learning opportunities for coaches that would benefit them and the students that they coach. It's really considering credentialing as a process used to ensure that individuals receive education above a bachelor's degree that is deemed necessary to perform their responsibilities. But also, it's important to roll out education that's consistent with the integrity and values of college sports. The second goal is to outline the key topics for educational content that form the basis for an agreed upon overarching curriculum. And I'll return to that point in a moment. Third is to look at credentialing education primarily through an accessible online learning management system to begin. So I mentioned that we started talking with these different groups in, um, throughout the winter and the spring, and some of the early feedback is to consider that some education may be you know, best delivered through an online format, others might be better face-to-face, -face, and to consider would there uh, be a mixed opportunity for mixed method education in this venue. I think one thing that's really interesting around this is because D2 University has established a framework for this online uh, learning and delivering coaches certification. It also is a ro has a robust reporting system. So the opportunities are endless and when we think about what might be um, possible and then what also might be logged in terms of compliance and reporting in the kinds of education that coaches engage in, whether it be online through an NCA offered portal or through their coaches associations or other venues. The last goal is to consider to de the development of accountability framework that delineates the expectation of each division regarding education topics and coaches' participation. And so obviously these are four overarching goals for developing a credentialing system. We are very much in the early phases of this. Um, so as we go forward and we think about the education piece that I mentioned and establishing that, that curriculum, we looked at credentialing, again, focusing on three fundamental areas of education, student-athlete well-being, NCA policies, rules, and processes, and then uh, approach to coaching and coaching skills and things that might be of interest to coaches in certain sports. Obviously, the concept of initial credentialing would be followed by continuing education. If we look at something like teacher education, where you do an initial licensure and then you um, require additional education after the initial licensure is complete, that's one of the concepts that's being discussed. I think one of the other pieces related to this and thinking about continuing education, the modules that could be offered online versus through a coaches association or other, is the early feedback asked the staff to consider the redundancies or minimizing those redundancies to content that a coach might take on campus versus something might be offered online, again, or through the coaches association. As I mentioned, the LMS, which is the learning management system, has the ability that was um, developed by Division II to provide this comprehensive reporting system. So one could imagine that the compliance community could get in, log education taken in, in multiple venues, and we could track on coaches' participation over time. 
We have a number of modules developed, but the pilot that we want to start with the WBCA and the NEBC, we want to start with two modules. One is on sexual violence prevention, the second is on mental health. The goal is to pilot these modules that are already being done in Division II with their coaches with the broader NABC Congress and also the WBCA uh, conference captains. Through this, it would have the ability for conference representation in the pilot and for folks, meaning the coaches, to share back information with their conferences. Participation in the pilot would not only be engaging in the education modules, but also would solicit feedback um, at the end of their modules and provide some opportunity for them to provide input on not only their educational experience, but other kinds of educational topics and engagements they would like to see. So really, it's great because the system allows us to capture data along the way. And as we look at developing this pilot and as we go through development of content and then potentially accountability framework, evaluation, feedback, and, and, and analysis along the way will be crucial to that process. Finally, I want to mention the time that, timeline that we're talking about. So I mentioned now we're beginning to socialize the concept of credentialing. I think we've been successful in touching a lot of different groups at a high level. And now as we roll out the pilot, the, the goal would be to get a little bit more in the weeds so people really look at the kinds of education opportunities that would be offered through the LMS, but also engaging the compliance community in the kind of reporting that they would be able to see through the system. We're collaborating with the NABC and the uh, WBCA, as I mentioned, to solicit their input. And in May, um, earlier this month, actually, we put, proposed the preliminary framework that I've described to you to the Board of Governors. They gave their uh, stamp of approval to continue to move forward in this direction um, through their telephonic meeting. Also, um, we will continue, as I mentioned, to collect data, gather feedback from current users, those in Division II, but also uh, the new coaches that will come on board through the pilot. The goal is in this academic year is to work on the content and the educational curriculum and framework. In 2020, in the spring, at the Board of Governors meeting, the goal is to present a five-year um, educational framework and overall plan for the development of coaches' credentialing through the the content itself. And then fall, it would be the opportunity for the different divisions to consider accountability um, at their level. And again, as I mentioned, uh, as part of this, we would evaluate, gather feedback, and, and do some analysis along the way. So with that, I'm going to stop and turn it over to Coach Bray. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. It's an honor to be here, and it's probably my duty, given Father Hesburgh is one of the founding fathers of this organization. Um, with the NABC, you serve a one-year term uh, as you rotate to the presidency. And as I said, when I rotated there at the Final Four in Minneapolis, uh, not much going on in college basketball when I rotate up there. So we've got our hands full. I, I do think, uh, and I'll keep my remarks a lot briefer so we can have some interaction. Um, I, I, I do think we've swung it a little bit where no question, coaches were visualized and thought of as part of a big, big part of the problem. And on some fronts, we still are. Uh, but I think we've been very engaged um, in communication through the NSA to be part of the solution. Um, as Dan said, uh, most of the recruiting calendar information came by way of the NABC and communication with the NABC. Um, we have to be better. We have to be more engaged. If there's one thing, if I can pull it off before my season starts, you know, October 1st, is to get us more engaged uh, as an association. Um, I do tip my cap to you on the credentialing. Um, I, I, I give you a story. Our, we had our banquet a, a month ago, and my senior walk-on uh, said, and he's a business major, Mendoza School of Business, brilliant young man, and it was very flattering to hear the remarks. You see, you know, the best course I took on campus was being part of this basketball program and what I learned and the different things. And we've lost that a little bit, uh, I think, that uh, uh, we are like, they have to take my class every semester and summer school. I know some of them don't like it sometimes, but they are there with us all the time. And so when I first heard of the credentialing, which I know came by way of, of this group, um, I thought anything we can do for 
certainly our current head coaches. My big concern is our next wave, our next generation of coaches coming up the pipeline. What they've seen, what they've heard, um, can we help educate them more? I, I was very fortunate. I was an education major. I was a high school teacher and coach. Um, so the, the educator hat, you know, was very comfortable for me. A lot of the young guys in our pipeline have not come by way of that route. And so uh, I think this can be very helpful. I know it's the very early stages, and I know as far as the NABC goes, we want to work really closely in developing this, um, you know, credentialing, continuing ed, wh whatever we want to call it. Uh, I, th I think it's a really positive thing. So um, with that, again, it's, it's great to be here and look forward to answering any questions. Thanks to all of you uh, staying on time. Uh, staying on topic and providing a lot of opportunity for questions from the Commission members. I know there there will be good discussion because you've teed up a lot of very important topics and topics that we've been thinking about. So with that, uh, the floor is open for Commission members' questions and comments. And it looks like Peter's ready to go first. Thank you, Carol. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, really appreciate uh, your taking the time and, and um, providing uh, your expertise. Um, so really uh, uh, excited about the reforms and the progress that's being made and the, the seriousness in which people are, are taking it on. So uh, with respect to credentialing, I agree with you, Mike and, and uh, Carrie. Very exciting. Uh, I think it's, it's uh, timely. Um, Mike, in particular, I think your leadership of the NABC couldn't come at a better time, uh, quite frankly, knowing you as long as I have and what you stand for. Uh, your leadership is going to be crucial, and your example is crucial. You were one of the first coaches to, to come out after the FBI stuff happened and suggest that it was the best thing that could happen to college basketball because we had to get rid of the people that weren't willing to follow the rules. So I, I uh, applaud you for that, and I'm, I'm excited about your leadership there. And the question is, could you envision, and, and Carrie and, and Mike, you can both weigh in on this, can you envision a scenario where with the credentialing, uh, comes the requisite promotion and or uh, acknowledgement so that uh, many times we have this, uh, this uh, uh, hierarchy within staffs, head coach, associate head coach and that kind of thing, where they would have to achieve a certain credentialing level before they would even be considered for an associate head coach so that it's not just seen as a promotion to help them earn more money and get ready to be a head coach, but it comes with some substance uh, that would require people to understand, you know, if I want to get to this next step, you know, I've got to do these things and then I'll be compensated maybe more appropriately, but I'll also be one step closer to becoming a head coach. Uh, and the same uh, is true where could you envision where someone would, would um, only be eligible, if you will, to be a head coach if they had a certain level of credential. So I'll let, I'll let you guys. Uh, no, I, I, I really like that, uh, Pete. I, I think... Uh, to be qualified, especially the last point you made, to be qualified to be a head coaching candidate, um, that you have had to uh, achieve a certain level, I think would be great. I think we've, again, the next the next wave of guys, the next generation, um, you know, I, I know I'm very sensitive to, and our board is, and our board is, and, um, and, and I know it's the very early stages, but uh, Carrie has been, we, we had breakfast this morning. We were throwing around all kinds of different ideas, but that's another one that I think is is really good. That there's some some level of achievement before you you take that seat as a head coach. And I'll just add that I think this is a really great opportunity for the coaching profession and and the opportunity to work with leaders like Mike and others um, at the NABC, and then hopefully with other sports as we continue to expand in other areas. We'll will give us the chance to think about what are the best options for the profession, what do they see in terms of opportunities within their, um, you know, sort of looking through the continuum of coaching and how education and credentialing can support that. Especially because it could be used as a carrot, you know, um, to incentivize people to really invest in their education and, and uh, help the profession. And because of the collaboration with USA Basketball, it might also be something where USA Basketball says, unless you've had a certain level of credentialing, you can't coach a USA uh, you know, team 
um, because we want people to see that it's, it's, um, it's uh, uh, something that you have to earn. It's not just about how many games your team has won or how great you are as a recruiter, but it's, and not just number of years that you've served, but have you invested in the education and given back to the game in some way as well. One quick comment and two questions. One, I think part of the NCAA's role is to better support student athletes and coaches. So obviously it's very early, but the culture's credentialing seems promising. The basketball academies seem positive and hopeful. So we'll see how those things go. But two tougher questions. I think the flip side of the NCAA historic role is to try and provide some legal and moral guidance. And as I reflect on, in my perception, the, the two most egregious scandals, one academic, the UNC, uh, UNC academic fraud for years, and then the FBI investigation. My perception is the NCA was largely irrelevant in those two. And is that perception right or wrong? Or is, you know, how do you feel about that? And then the second separate question is, obviously, we really supported the addition of independent directors. That was fantastic. I was concerned that there was only one woman appointed to those five, but just sort of question, as so you think about diversity of thought and leadership, why those five slots did, did only one go to a, a woman leader, a female leader? I'll maybe address the, the first part of your question there in terms of the kind of investigation and the academic misconduct. And, and I think there, you know, we certainly heard voices of where is the NCAA um, in these important matters that reflect our values. And starting with the Southern District of New York, you know from a timing standpoint, it was important to let the federal investigators do their work. You don't want to, and, and we were told not to intercede in that regard. Uh, those are reaching the point of conclusion. And that is not that our enforcement staff hasn't been active in this space, they certainly have. And I think you can anticipate notice of allegations coming when they're right. And there has been aggressive work in, the, in that regard and I think you'd, you, will, you will see the fruits of that particular work at that point in time. One of the tricky parts, as you know, is that the third parties who were predominantly identified in the Southern District of New York to have no obligation to, to respond to the NCA, and that's a, a very challenging aspect. The importation uh, part that I mentioned will be helpful, uh, Chairman Duncan, but I do want the group to know that you know third parties who were a primary focus of the investigation coming out of the Southern, Southern District of New York are not compelled and may not even be interested in speaking to the NCA, so that represents a challenge. Um, but you will, activity has been going on, and you're gonna see the fruits of that activity within the NSA structure here in due time, and, and I think fairly quickly. Um, the academic misconduct piece, and Carol was uh, kind enough to, to chair a, a group that provides some recommendation to our presidents. Um, yes, I, I would share with you that in my 30 some years in the business, I don't know of any other conversation that I've had with more presidents about what is the proper role of the NSA as it relates to academic misconduct. And, the balance between institutional autonomy as it comes to campus decisions on the academic programming and services versus our fair competition to each other. And I think there was a sense of, hey, we need to examine is the balance, has the balance been properly struck? And it is a very, very difficult issue. And those of you that are presidents, I know guard very um, um, sincerely and with great, um, um, great interest in maintaining uh, your integrity and your ability to make decisions as it relates to the academic programming on your campus, where does that fall collectively when it impacts fair competition? So there are proposals out there right now that we're asking our conferences to chime in on. Do we want an NCA rule that says, you know what, regardless of what a campus has found, if it's believed to be systemic, pervasive, and put individuals on the field of competition over the academic integrity of the institution, do we want to have a bylaw that the NCA can charge the institution? That is an active conversation right now, and there are a wide range of opinions as to whether that's the right tool to give the NCAA. Should you have requirements or best practices that say you as a campus every year need to examine the academic offerings for your student athletes in a series of data, is that regulation necessary? Or is that already being done on our campuses? And, and should the NCAA require that to be done when in fact it's happening in practice? So there is an active conversation with our membership on the issue of academic integrity as it relates to the association. And we're very interested in getting the feedback from our membership through the conference meetings. And ultimately, our board of directors will decide the appropriate role, whether the balance has been struck properly based on all of that feedback. What about the diversity question of the independent members? 
I, I can take that question. So um, as the nominating committee considered all of the, uh, the nominees and the candidates for the independent director positions, as I mentioned, there was a lot of aspects of diversity, as you mentioned, diversity of thought, background, expertise, those kinds of things that were considered in addition to the kinds of institutions whether the person was a former student athlete. And so I think there were multiple factors in addition to race and ethnicity that were considered as well as gender. And so while I wasn't part of the deliberations, I know that was front of mind for the nominating committee and part of the requirements and criteria that they put out to the membership and to the public as to what they were considering. Um, I got one. Uh, all right, I have Walt and then Chris and then Nancy. Uh, so I just will comment. I, I agree with what you just said, Carrie, about the complexity, but I want to add my voice to, to Arnie's. I, I was very disappointed you could only find one woman. That's just, it, it just doesn't, it, 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 it insults uh, common sense. Um, the, the second question, and follow, again, it kind of follow up to Arnie's. The, the, one of the major scandals, black eyes, that all of college sports has right now is the investigation by the Southern District of New York. And in light of that, I was disappointed that the NCA did not take the Knight Commission's recommendation that uh, apparel and shoe contracts uh, be made public. I realized that that would be a major challenge to presidents of private institutions and others who aren't subject to FOIA requirements, but we are facing a significant crisis that the influx of dirty money is damaging the credibility of all of college athletics. And I hope that the NCA and the Board of Governors will rethink that, um, that specific issue, that, that sunshine is the best disinfectant and um, all contracts between universities and any of their employees with outside uh, shoe and apparel con uh, companies or any other companies that are providing money ought to be made public. I wonder if any of you would want to comment on that. I'll give a, a shot um, in your points well taken. So in the certification process that Danny spoke of, the, the need for transparency and the financial interactions and where money is coming to support the summer events has been a part now of the certification process. So there is increased sunshine to your point in that regard. Uh, you're right, the broader issue of kind of a requirement that says across the board all contracts need to have um, the, the sunshine that you're looking for has simply not been a, um, adopted at this point in time, but your point's well taken, and we can certainly have the board examine that. Chris? Thank you, Carol. Uh, I, I think about this larger issue of what's been facing uh, college basketball in the context of mindset, and, I, and as I was saying in the earlier session with my colleagues, that I feel like the transfer rule kind of walks as a concomitant along with some of the work that's been done as a reaction to what's happening with the FBI investigation, et cetera, et cetera. There's a disproportionate number, and this is what the, the NCA has done a good job of, of uh, researching, the number of student athletes coming into basketball, I think they're going to play professional basketball, is disproportionately and statistically higher than every other sport. Uh, I ran a D3 institution, I ran a D1 institution, a mid-major, and every single player thinks that, or I've seen every single one, but close to every single player thinks they're gonna, they're gonna be playing for the, the Lakers or something like that, uh, which we know is not the case. So I'd love to get a little bit of information on how this transfer portal's working out, maybe from Dan and Mike in particular, Coach Bray. Um, how's that going? Um, because I think it's like, seven, I think I heard the number, 70% of all D1 basketball players will, will transfer. Um, and uh, I'm not saying, I'm trying to be agnostic on it. It's either good or bad. APR is moving in the right direction, it seems like, in college basketball, for men's basketball, so I don't want to push back on that. I want to commend predecessors on the Knight Commission because I think we're a big part of, you know, pushing that. But I'm just curious of what, how does that fit in or slot in? What are the early responses of uh, reports from the front line on the uh, transfer portal and transfer rule? Well, it's a great question. Since it's new, it's certainly gotten an awful lot of attention. Um, I think it's achieving the, one of the goals of the transfer working group in that it now provides for 
freedom for students that, that are interested in transferring and not having to seek permission from their institution, from their head coach and athletic director, in order to be able to explore that opportunity. I think we got to a point in, in the business where that just didn't make sense anymore. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't good for the institution, it wasn't good for the head coach, because in the few cases where they tried to draw the line and not permit uh, other schools for consideration for transfer, it didn't play well in public, and and it was um, it seemed overly restrictive. And so I do think it's it's met that end. I think it's brought a lot more attention to the issue of transfer because of the the fact that the names are out there now, and it's um, there is more sunshine uh, you know on it. Um, it is it, it is a significant issue in in basketball, as we know the commission on college basketball weighed in on this topic, even though it really wasn't their area of you know of uh, of uh, focus, um, but because of the third party influence, they made a very strong point that the year in residency should stay in place for men's basketball and women's basketball and football, and that is indeed been the case. But we have a lot more movement now because of graduate transfers um, and, and, and the ability to get waivers um, for even undergraduates who have yet to graduate. Um, and get in certain circumstances, um, they can qualify for immediate eligibility if there are factors such as, um, you know, runoffs or mental health issues or, or things that can be documented that you know, that would uh, give the membership and the committees that work on this the opportunity to uh, give that up. So th that's it. It's still a very open-ended question. I think, you know, Mike can provide some perspective on, a, on the ground level of how, you know, it affects his job, his assistants, and the teams that he competes with. Um, but I, I think your point is very well taken. It is part and parcel to all of this because third-party influence, even in school, those that have influence before students make decisions where to attend continue to have that influence while they're still in school as well. Yeah, I think uh, um, the uh, the portal at least has brought it up above ground. You know, uh, every back channel was worked, and I'm sure I know guys that weren't playing on my bench were being talked to by their high school coach. So it's it's gotten above ground a little bit. I think as coaches, we're concerned about the number of waivers um, to the point where we feel maybe the NSA has given too much of a blueprint on how to get a waiver and not serve the one year because that has been a bit of a deterrent. And also, I was a transfer. I came back and sat out a year at GW, and I was a five-year man, and it was good for me uh, on all, way, all phases. We actually have one young, young man under the heading of keeping your options open, a great player in the ACC. He's in the transfer portal, and he's in the draft. That's pretty good, huh? He's got a lot of options there. Um, you know, so... Um, uh, but I, that, the, 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 waiver, the waiver thing has really bothered coaches because kids feel they can go and, you know, bring up enough of a case to get eligible right away. So they're more apt to want to go. I can get eligible. Whereas the, the one year in residency was a bit of a deterrent with things. So um, I have a couple of comments and then a, a bigger question that I think we're all puzzling over. Um, so the first one is, um, I didn't hear you mention, Kevin, on a positional accountability, the role of boards, and I don't want to see us ever drop the fact that boards create contracts which include commitments on the part of coaches and athletic directors to um, and presidents of universities at the top. Uh, to adhere to various policies. So I'm sure we are not giving up on educating boards as well. I just didn't hear you talk much about it and maybe it's not in the current legislation. We single out presidents and athletic directors and coaches, but that all rolls up to the board. So you don't need to comment. I just need to hear more of it. Um, secondly, um, Carrie, I think the application of credentialing is what's really important. How does it play when somebody sits through X number of webinars, which is pretty easy to check the box? We left a long time ago institutional self-study. Maybe Walt and I are the only people who miss it. But I do think that there has to be some recognition that the change we want in the credentialing process has to go back home and appear in improvement, which is typically database 
and evidence proof. So uh, those are just two points. So these crises, uh, and there'll be another one coming, you know that, um, would suggest that um, as, as presidents of universities and certainly in the organization of the NCAA, we have to crack the code on crisis management. We shouldn't have the crises brought to us. We'd like to think that we're ahead of some of them. And if transparency is one tool for leadership and crisis management, as you have sat around in the back room saying, God, I wish this hadn't happened, what do you figure you're going to do about it for the one you don't know is coming? So is there a conversation afoot? Is there a team working separate from the day-to-day -day operation of the NCAA? Is there something? People like independent observers like the Knight Commission and its expression of policy that would help us all get ahead of the embarrassment that comes from something that we probably knew was rolling down the hill way too fast. It might be all the money that's changing hands, but I just wonder if there's something you, especially the three of you, could say about the organization and the culture. And I'll, I'll clarify it a little bit more. We're pretty impressed with the speed with which this work got done. Is that an exception? Is that the norm going forward? So those are the questions I think, if you had a minute, you might ask yourself. I'll provide an initial response and can be joined by my colleagues. So I think the new Division I governance structure was designed, Nancy, to, to be more nimble and more efficient. And I think what you see in the college basketball reform reflected that. Um, and your voice helped in that regard. But obviously, you have a federal investigation that's a catalyst for those changes. Um, what's going on this summer as it relates to the state and federal legislation that Kerry and, and a, a new working group has been appointed, I think is another attempt at moving quickly in that regard. We have oversight committees for the first time ever. We're, we're charging our groups. We have a basketball, a football oversight committee, all other sports that are supposed to telegraph out better what the challenges are. Whether those predict the next crisis, I don't know. But I have been fairly impressed that over the last five years we have a structure of people who are supposed to be looking at the health and safety of the game and looking at what's next. And we've never had that before in the oversight committee. So, you know, that's helpful. Sports wagering is another great example. So we understand what the states are doing. So now we have a, gr a group of, of leaders led by the president at Syracuse who are aggressively addressing this in an attempt to kind of thwart what may be problematic issues that arise. That's the best response I can have, is trying to have oversight groups who are looking ahead, anticipating what those challenges are, and a governance structure that is able to move quickly when our governors and our boards say you need to move now. That's, that's I think, our best response. And these independent directors, do you think they'll flow into the division boards as another, if transparency is one solution and independent eyes is a second solution, how deep can that go? These are the kinds of things I would assume we'd be getting used to. I think that's a very good point. I think the commitment of, of President Kaler, and now it's going to be President Capilouto from Kentucky and, and Bud and others, is let, let's see how this works at the governor's. We have great expectations that this is going to be highly successful. And the extent to which we can build on that success within the Division I structure, I think we're, it's all in due time for that analysis to look. And there's a commitment to examining that. Any further comments from panelists to Nancy's questions? Yeah, I'll, I'll offer for what it's worth. You know, I, I've been at the NCAA almost seven years now, and before that I worked at a conference office and I was an athletic director of Division II institution prior to that. And I've been, been in and around the NCAA men's basketball championship for a long, very long time and responsible for it now. And I remember, you know, many years ago, maybe a decade or so back, I, I, I used to always think that the NCAA and the tournament was very proactive in, in the way that it managed the tournament and the game. And then, for whatever reason, I, I, th I think that, that the membership um, and the organization got more reactive than proactive. You know, that the conferences in many ways or institutions were ahead in policy and practice 
than the, na than the national organization was. And to Kevin's point, I think I've, I've seen a swing of that in, in the last few years now with, with the new governance structure uh, being more nimble, with the oversight committees focused on individual sports and their specific and, and unique issues, um, with the commission's work and, and the ambitious timeline with which that happened. And now with the Board of Governors, um, you know, uh, with this new working group on name, image, and likeness, and a report due in October, those are all very ambitious uh, endeavors and timelines that you know just a few years ago we didn't see with any regularity at, in, in, the, in the NCA structure. And so I, I do think that there's a, there's a movement that hopefully will be supported by the membership because ultimately that's, that's who needs to support you know, the, the speed and nimbleness with which to address things and try to be proactive in what those issues are that are speeding towards us than being reactive when we get hit with them. And I'll just make one comment uh, regarding your, um, your, your comment on the credentialing and, and evidence-based. And I certainly appreciate that. And I think um, data collection, analysis, evaluation, and evidence of learning along the way has to be absolutely part of this. I spent a good part of my career, I started as a teacher and then I went into teacher education and really worked with teachers like, how do you know your students are learning? And this is the same concept at a different application and I think it's critical because, you know, the check the box is going to get you one thing in terms of compliance. And I did talk about compliance because that is important to the NCA broader community of compliance, obviously, but certainly as a former, you know, teacher, educator, educator and still focus on education and learning. I think it's absolutely critical that we create something in collaboration with the coaches that's not only meaningful, accessible, meets them where they're at, but then we also make sure that it's impacting them in the way that we would hope and then in, in the end impacting their students. Bud. So Danny, you, you broached the subject a little bit, but I was going to ask just the panel to talk about name, image, and likeness and some of the things that are going on and, and where you think that's going. I, I, I think that I said earlier that I think that's a pretty critical issue that's facing intercollegiate athletics. Um, I can take that one. So um, recently the um, board and, and President Emmert announced that they were creating a working group to look at federal and state legislation. Obviously the federal and state legislation, and actually I'm not going to steal the thunder of the panel that's later this morning because I know that they're going to talk about this specifically, but really looking at some of these issues that have come out, have come out at the federal level and the state level in California and looking at issues around whether students should be able to benefit from their name, image, and likeness. Obviously, with the charge that was put out for the working group, there are parameters around what the board felt like was a direction in which would be acceptable and not acceptable. I think uh, the board was fairly clear um, that this is really not about a model that would um, convert student athletes to be employees, but rather looking at opportunities within um, what's been proposed would, would to also stay consistent with the mission and values of the association. So, um, you know, the, a working group's been named. We have our first meeting coming up in the be beginning part of June. Val Ackerman, and, uh, who is the commissioner of the Big East, and Gene Smith, who is the athletic director at Ohio State, are the co-chairs of that group. And so I look forward to, um, you know, being part of their discussions and facilitating that dialogue and, and reporting an update to the board in, in August. Um, but I think the, the panel later will take up rest of that and Scott Beerby, our general counsel, will address some of the additional issues. So, so another easy one, any thoughts about sports wagering and what's going on? No, sure. As I, as I mentioned, um, similar to what Kerry referenced in terms of the task force, we have an active group, as you know, that's examining all the implications really with kind of a twofold. How do we protect the integrity of the game in light of a new changing environment on single sport wagering? And how do we protect our student athletes? And with that lens, uh, conversations are ongoing. They are seeking feedback right now from the conference offices on a number of things. One of the top of mind issues is uh, student athlete slash player availability. How important is that in terms of, of providing information that provides some of the sunshine and transparency? There are mixed reactions as to whether that's appropriate within the collegiate environment, how one gets that done. But that's just one of a string of ideas, Bud, that will come forward through the governance structure and we're actively seeking feedback right now, that working group from our membership on what are the appropriate next steps in light of this changing environment. 
Well, I just want to step in for two seconds. I'm on that committee with uh, Stan Wilcox and Chancellor Severide, and, and in according to the earlier point that Nancy made about getting ahead of things, and I think that is one of the things where the NTA and the members and the other leadership is really trying to get ahead of the issues. And you pointed out one of the key issues right there, right there, Kevin. We're also spending a lot of time talking to professional sports about lessons learned. Uh, and, and try not to recreate the will and, and anticipate a few things. So it's, I, I think it's going to be a, a good step by the NCAA to show that it can actually get in front of issues and, and provide the appropriate oversight and guidance. So. I have um, Nick as the next one, and then following that I have Mike. Any yeah. others? Christine and Jacques. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I just want to make a comment and then ask uh, Mike a question. and. A little bit of advice from Mike. Um, I think you used the word freedom, Dan, and I think it should not go unnoticed as a real important principle that's affecting the dialogue with students and student athletes and discussions that are driving the legislation. And I would recognize that that word is, is really affecting and it's playing out in every forum. And I, I would not lose sight of that key word for the student athlete. Um, Mike, I think your comments about the transparency and the transfer rule is really fascinating, and I think it's insightful. Um, help me out just on things like transfer and the freedom of the kids how do I respond to the kids about the coaches moving? And what do I, how do you all talk about that? And I know you're all committed to these kids, but help me out as a chancellor or president on how I have those conversations. Now that is, that is a little bit of the dilemma. I mean, we have the freedom to go and move. Um, and, and yet up until now they, they have not. Um, and, and so I, I have, again, I've felt, and, and I think our coaches immediately react. We got all these kids in the portal and, and I think it's just got to kind of run its course here a little bit. You know, this is new territory. Um, but, but I agree they should have, you know, I, I think they should have the freedom to do it. I, my, my assistant coach, it's a, it's an interesting dynamic. I'll give you another kind of on the front lines example. You know, the portal is a whole nother recruiting pool for us. And I have an assistant who's a great guy, and he came in, he, in about a month ago. He said, Coach, every morning I get up, I read the Bible and check the portal. I said, switch that order. <laughs> well, I said, switch that order. Switch that order. You know, and, and so, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and I've gone down the hall and, and, hey, fellas, anybody new in the portal today? What okay. do we got? And, and so that, that's, the, that's the front lines of it and, and where we're at. Um, you know, I, I kind of live under, and I've tried to bring this up in our board meeting, Vic Bubis, the legendary coach at Duke, used to have a saying, you got to get them, you got to keep them, you got to coach them. I think it's a little bit on us to, you know, I look at it as I, I, I'm, I'm hurt when I lose somebody and I haven't retained them. You know, it's on us to do that. And I think that's a little bit of a, a change in mentality that coaches now have to adapt. You've got to do a better job managing your roster. Uh, and 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 that at that situation yeah, and take care of your kids <laughs> take care of your guys and yeah. you know show them a path and of course with the licensing thing you know I'm starting to think okay the eighth man is really upset he's not starting but he's only sold two jerseys in the bookstore so now I can he only sold two jerseys that's why you're eighth man and 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 you know so anyway it's just having fun with it you know you're, anyway. You're very I'm thinking it all through very now. Savvy guy. I'm thinking it all through. <laughs> My comment is more of a philosophical question. So coaching is a very complicated profession. It's unique. It's idiosyncratic. It, it has all kinds of characteristics to it that make it a self-governing kind of enterprise, like the law or like medicine. So in law and the medicine, uh, governance is derivative of the, of the profession itself. Uh, the notion of who's in the profession, who's out of the profession, what it takes to be in the profession, what it takes to be certified, what it takes to stay certified, what it takes to stay in, and conduct unbecoming often leads to one's dismissal. You are disbarred, you are this, you are that. 
And so this notion somehow for an association like the National Basketball Coaches Association, which has been in place for 92 years and formed the tournament 80 years ago and then ultimately gave it to the NCAA, the question I have is really, uh, Coach, for you and then for the others, it, it goes to this notion of is it possible for basketball coaches to govern themselves and to produce the conduct and outcomes relative to student outcomes, relative to coaching outcomes that we're all looking for, or do we really have to spend all of our time talking about how to govern this very, very unique profession? And you know this probably better than most. I mean, you're a very successful coach. You, you've been very successful at Notre Dame, and, and it's a very complicated thing, and few of the rest of us even understand it. Uh, I made a comment earlier today about it not being so complex because you have this focus on just a few athletes and a few other coaches. Is it self-governable, and if not, uh, why? It, it should be. That is a great point, and I think that's something that the NABC is coming back to. A little history. I want to say 15 years ago, we had a crisis, and I don't know what the crisis was with rule breaking, and all the head coaches were called to Chicago. And it was the one time we had almost perfect attendance of our head coaches. Um, and it was a little, it was all, you know, we need to be better, and it was all good stuff. Um, and when we came out of that, the NBC started going down the road of having a, a, a group of coaches, uh, uh, maybe retired coaches, uh, start, you know, censor or investigate or police our profession. And it never got any momentum. I'll say this, that's back on the table, and I think in the midst of all this, that is something we should really look at. We have not done that. We have not censored any coaches that have run afoul. Well, but before censoring would be like, these people are certified coaches, these people are not. These are rule breakers, they're out. They're not certified by this association any longer. I, I, don't know, I don't know why everything has to be placed onto the association of the schools. It is a profession, like, like law or medicine, which do govern each other quite effectively. They have continuing legal education, which every uh, lawyer is required to continue to pursue, continuing medical education. So there's no more excuses for not knowing something or not being educated. Did you get your continuing education credits or not? It doesn't make any difference how good of a lawyer you are, how good of a doctor you are. You must still continue to be educated. And so it would seem to me owning the profession might be a really important thing. I, I agree, and I think we're going down that road. I have a question back. Why hasn't an athletic director or a president acted in some of these current cases already? What, I, I think a lot of our coaches want to know what, why hasn't it, the hammer come down? In, and, and again, I'm, I'm a little naive to it. Uh, is it legal stuff, lawyering, a lot of lawyers? And you know, I think our profession would love to see the hammer be dropped on some of these situations. I think we need a, we need an explosion back, you know, and, and I'm hoping John Duncan presented to the head coaches in minute and he said, I know it costs you jobs, it costs you recruits, it costs you games. We're gonna follow it vigorously. And I know the confidence of our coaches are, nah. And I, I'm confident. I, I really think this time we've got to do they've got to do something with it. But that's a little bit of the mentality of you know, how there's been no hammer from the top on campus. And, and so that just giving you some feedback from the front lines. Well, that, that's consistent with the question I was going to ask Kevin, but I want to, I want to jump in with Christine. But, but the idea that there's no research that would suggest that coaches' contracts already include language about co cooperation, there, there's no contract that we ever did at Northeastern, little old Northeastern, that didn't have a clause in there about you have to follow NCAA rules and you have to be, you have to be cooperative with any investigation. So, you know, sometimes we hide behind the, the stuff about what the association has to do when in reality, is there anybody here that's been a chancellor or a president of an institution that you don't require in a contract that they have to be compliant or uh, cooperative with, with NCAA or, or conference uh, investigation? I mean, that, that, that's a little bit beyond the pale for me. I mean, I just can't imagine that there are contracts out there and if people are going to hide behind the fact, well, you know, we don't have the, the language in there. <laughs> really? I'd, I would rather go to court and have people say, well, you know, you're going to get sued because you fired somebody because they violated NCAA rules and they didn't cooperate. Okay, let's go to court. Thanks, Peter. Okay, Christine, and then Jacques is going to have the last question here, given our time. Um, yeah, Coach, I, I guess... Um, 
So I was a member of the transfer group. So I, I would ask you to take back to your coaches that, you know, one of the, the uh, reasons we made the portal, we did not mean to make a recruiting system, even though we knew it would play out a little bit like that. Uh, we made it so there'd be an official date and time stamp on when a student could get recruited to try to have people follow the rules. So um, if you could remind them, it, it kind of came because of, of things that were not being handled properly. Um, and also when the students go in there, the accountability piece, right, they're re relinquishing their scholarship because the other school doesn't have to continue to support them. So there's an accountability piece on the students and, and we, I, I sincerely hope as a faculty athletic rep and, and a you know, higher education uh, believer here uh, that students are being educated in what they are doing by putting their name in there. Um, we also really hope for minimal waivers but hope is not a plan. So we <laughs> see how that went. Um, but I, I got to know Phil Martelli quite well through that, that working group and I really appreciated his honesty and, and his um, shedding light on a lot of things that were going on and, and he really contributed to that process. Uh, and right before this Knight Commission meeting last spring, so after the Rice Commission recommendations came out and, and only a few weeks after, uh, Phil was here with us and, and I talked to him offline and. And he said, you know, I, I don't know how this is going to go. He said, I, I just don't know if the coaches get it. I've got coaches coming to me still saying that that Rice Commission stuff, like we're not going to do any of that, right? He said, I, I just don't know what these guys are thinking. And how's that going? Is there, are you able to, to work in that arena? We are, things? you know, we, we've had to drag them, a lot of our membership along with us. Um, I, I've been very disappointed that you know, I was in the ACC meetings last week, and some of the guys that complain the most about the Rice Commission, first of all, we haven't even gone through the recruiting calendar yet. We haven't even tried it yet. But many of those guys haven't ever been on a committee and have never been part of anything. So we deal with a lot of that in our profession, which has been frustrating for me. Um, and I've tried to, in this short window, as we go into new territory, look, open mind, this is not gonna be the final product, using the recruiting calendar as an example. We need feedback. The academy's gonna change, we're gonna, you know. One of the things that I thought was great about, uh, just a point again from the front lines, the high school weekends in June. When I was on the road the last week, I had two high school coaches say, Coach, I really appreciate you coming to see my guy with my team in June. You know, I never, my guy's always with the travel team, but you're gonna see him with my team and I really appreciate that you guys did that. So I felt like, okay, that is a good sign. That's a good first step because we've always wanted to recruit more through the educational institution. I wanna be able to walk down the hallway into a guidance counselor office and go, what's he like? And, or, you know, when you go into a high school, the principal comes by all the time. Let me tell you about Jimmy, you know, whereas we were out on the, AAU circuit, you, you didn't have that. So um, we're dragging some of them with us. Um, we're trying to, we're gonna educate them. But I think the thing is, um, I'm excited about it. You know, Dan and I have talked about it a lot and we'll tweak it, but, um, and I also tried to tell some of our guys at the ACC meetings, like, look, this is happening, stop. Like, do you understand what exploded? Like, we're, we're doing this. I need some positive feedback after this summer. First off, I want to say thank you for your work. You know, as a former uh, student athlete, I don't know where I'd be without that scholarship, so thank you for that. But uh, just kind of got a question about the continuing education component of what you're doing, right? I think that Chris hit on a very uh, important narrative of the student athlete about the identity piece. Uh, when you're recruited, I went through the recruiting process. It's, it's all about ball. It's never about education. So, you know, is getting a degree the end? No. I mean, we all know that when you go and throw your hat in the air and go accept a degree, that the journey's just beginning. But a lot of guys aren't equipped for that minute that happens directly after that. So with those funds, I wanna ask, is there gonna be any more resources thrown at, hey, are we helping guys figure out what their passion, what their purpose is? Because uh, the degree is just half the story, it's not all the, sto all the story. So I think that I would love to see some more accountability on universities of, you know, can we help these guys uh, uh, with, what, with what's next? Because I think that's the hard part about college and sports, right, is that you gotta live in the now and prepare for the future. So uh, what, I, what the question I wanna raise is part of those funds where they'll be more allocated to student resources to uh, figuring stuff like that up. Yeah, 
I'll address the, the fundamental point you raised about preparing young people for life after graduation. So our board of directors identified five key goals that drive the next five years, and the first one is just that. We we're very encouraged by the graduation success of our student athletes, but we want to make sure the experience they have on campus best prepares them for what is next. And so the Committee on Academics, which Walt used to chair and is now chaired by Jack DeJoya, is examining that exact issue. What are the type of experiences that we need to allow competitive Division I student athletes to have in their campus, whether it's internships, study abroad, practicums, increased work with faculty members, We'll extend their eligibility clock should they want to have stopouts to go pursue other activities because I think there is a real commitment that we like where the graduation rates are. We have work to do in some sports, but with the broader issue is preparing young people for what it's like to be successful in a very competitive job market. And so we're looking forward to having the results of the Committee on Academic Recommendations about how we bring those tools into place. And I think some of that, to your point, will involve some of the funding mechanisms that should come from the NCA or simply should be a prioritization within the campus or the conference to make sure we're preparing young people for what's next. And, and you know, just on, on another point, you know, I would challenge you that that process is, is about equity, not equality. Because the, the problems that Coach Bray has in Notre Dame uh, or, or the advantages that he has at being Notre Dame may not be the same as some other public institutions where the demographic of person that goes there is different. So what I would challenge you is that that is, is about equity uh, and, and not equality. You know. So I just wanted to um, go back to Walt's question and Kevin's response uh, on transparency, which I think was something like I hear you. And I wondered if you wanted to say one or two more things um, beyond that, because it's such an important issue to us as a commission. Yeah, th that's fair, and I would reiterate again that transparency is occurring through the certification process of the events that has money that are coming from the shoe companies, and, and Dan alluded to that, so that has already been ratcheted enough in significant ways. Um, you all know, as you are working with not only the employees that you are engaged with, but the, the shoe companies, there needs to be agreement across the board beyond even the NCAA individuals that there's this willingness and this openness to share publicly all of those records. And um, candidly, I just think more work needs to be done, more conversations need to be had by those outside our NCAA structure as to why this is important, why this will help the broader collegiate model. You know. Just like the Southern District of New York, we don't control all the third parties and their, their, their ability to cooperate with us. So, you know, the bully pulpit that you have is important. And I would just suggest, um, Nancy, that more conversation needs to continue to occur within the NCA and then between the NCA and the third parties if we're going to move the ball. Thank you. I, I would just offer that uh, we believe that when we were able to get much more transparency around academic issues, we reached a kind of tipping point, and then things really, really started to happen that we now see have been quite effective and productive. So we'll continue to push hard there. I want to thank the panelists, and thank you especially for your, your direct answers to the questions and your candor. Helpful to hear some stories from the front lines as well. Thank you, Coach Bray. Uh, commissioners, please stay in your seats. Um, we're just going to transition out the panelists and we're moving directly into our next panel. So thank you, panel.